quick overview of what's in the first 11 chapters, and then I'll supplement some material on it as well here. We call the first 11 chapters the primeval history. The one author, I think it might have even been them in the book, talks about shadowy prehistory. That is, all of this happened before there was writing. So there's no contemporary written records that are there. We talk about prehistoric. This is prehistoric period. The writings that we're reading now, uh, that we have available, were written sometime after the event. And in these first 11 chapters, there are very few ties to verifiable people and places. There are a few of them that I might mention as we come along. But again, it's not the land of Oz or Never Never Land. Uh, there are a few ties there, but we know it is this world that we're aware of and that we live in uh, that's being talked about here. Those are the first 11 chapters. Here's a quick outline. We're going to be going into some detail in some of these. We've already talked about the creation of the world. We haven't got, we're beginning chapter 2 to the Sabbath day. But Adam and Eve in chapter 2, we'll be looking at those in some detail here. It would be nice if we could stop there with Adam and Eve, because the next chapter is when the bad news comes in, the fall. If we didn't have three, we wouldn't need anything else in Scripture. Uh, then we have moving from Adam to Noah. We have the flood, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. Uh, what happened to Noah after the flood. Then we have what's called the Table of Nations in chapter 10, which geographically spreads out to the whole ancient Near Eastern world. Then we have the story that we know about Tower of Babel, and then in chapter 11, we have again narrowing down to the Semites, the Semitic people, which is what Israel is. So that's kind of the flow of what's going on in those 11 chapters. Let's go back to one of the things that we were talking about in the first chapter. In chapter 2, it really starts... The chapter divisions were established by Stephen Langton, who was an Archbishop of Canterbury in the 13th century. And the, the verses were always there, not so numbered the same way. The chapter divisions were set up by him. And I'm a bit disappointed in him that he blows the first one. Because if you notice here, we come to the end of Genesis 1, and that's day 6. We pause and say, okay, good place to stop. We go off, get a cup of coffee, come back, and all of a sudden we have day 7. We should have gone one more day like it's split it in the middle of chapter 2 verse 4 but anyway after we get into verse 4 what name for God is used there how is this different from what we had in chapter 1 the Lord God the term that's used there is I don't know what that P means I just crept in there yod Hey vav Hey in Hebrew Yahweh is how it's usually pronounced in English. This is God's first name, if you like. So chapter 1 was just God, general term. This is meeting God up close and personal. So it's an intimate covenant name. In most English translations, it's written like this, L-O-R-D, you notice you've got small caps here. This is how you can distinguish when you're reading your English Bibles, most of you, the only one that I know that puts Yahweh in there is the Jerusalem Bible, but most of us don't have. When you see this, you know that it's talking about Yahweh, this intimate, personal name. What's the relationship between humanity and God here? In chapter 1, it talks about God speaking. Here we have God getting intimately involved in this creation, picking up the clay, modeling it, forming it. Like God gets his hands dirty. This direct involvement in God's creation uh, in this particular chapter. God still has authority, if you like. He is the potter. Use that term because this is the verb that's used here is the one for potters forming things. So 
So he molds it and shapes it as he wills. But it's a different kind of picture from God. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But in the first chapter, there's kind of a transcendence there. The God of power who speaks and things come into being. The picture I have here is the God who's down. This is the children's story. God who's there with them, uh, working and making things. Reminds me of the professor that I worked at with in England, my PhD supervisor, who was, you know, in our eyes, well, not quite God, but up there. And he came over to visit us later on, and he was down on his hands and knees playing horsey with our kids. <laughs> so this is, if you like, not to downplay, but this is the horsey God, uh, as compared to the professor God in the first chapter. What can we see about humanity here? The physical body is important. It goes into detail in forming the physical body. We are incarnate beings. We might not think of it in these terms. It talks about Jesus becoming incarnate, made flesh. We are also incarnate. Our bodies are part of who we are, and so what we do with our bodies is important. In the New Testament period, there was a group of heretics, or pagans, if you like, that had an agnostic view. First John is writing to combat them. They would say, our body is not important. We can do anything we want with our body. Uh, asceticism is the idea where you deprive yourself. You live like a monk in a cave and live just on bread and water. And then also promiscuity, doing anything that you want with your body. Uh, a Gnostic could say this, but that's not what we can say because our bodies are important. Uh, they've been created by God, they're part of his creation, and we also have our life is given to us in the picture in Genesis chapter 2 uh, by God's breath. So we have kind of a different feeling about this account of creation. In this account, too, we also have a picture of the garden. There are several verses uh, that talk about forming the garden. It's the place for human activity in the world. Where are we supposed to live and move and have our being? As I say, humans are to act as God's co-regents, co-kings. He creates and cares for things, but he's also created or given us that same responsibility. So we're also supposed to be creative, producing new things. Now, we don't do them in the same way God does, but we are creative. On the economic level, for example, the whole idea of producing capital, producing wealth. It's not for our own self-interest, but it's to nurture and look after creation that he allows us to create these things. Also, we talked about beauty. We as being in the image of God, I think this is part of being in the image of God. We can appreciate and produce things like art and music and literature. And all of things are reflective of God's creation. God creates, and so we create and it's not things from completely from new that we're creating. We are also creatures. This is an aside, verses 10 through 14. It talks about rivers that flow from the garden. I mentioned there's not many places that we can actually point to physically in these first chapters that we know where they are geographically. But there are a couple of places here, especially in verse 14. It says the name of the third river is the Tigris, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Those are rivers that we know. They're still around today. The other two rivers, there's some debate about where they're. We're not sure, because there's no four place where four rivers come together. Uh, I'm specifically interested in the second river, because in verse well, it says the gold of that land is good. But I want to kind of find that river. We're not sure exactly uh, where it is. 
In the midst of all of this, God's creation, God's putting the human being in the garden to look after it. Uh, it was for his benefit. But there was a limitation placed on the human being. You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. God has given the human being everything that was needed for life. He was living in, I'll turn the news for this sometimes, it's paradise. Uh, but there's one restriction that was placed on this. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, verse uh, 17. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Good and evil, this could be another merism. Remember, heavens and earth we talked about. Cats, raining cats and dogs, or Dan of Yeshiva. All knowledge we might be talking about here. Uh, there's one restriction that's given. And we've also got to remember, you know, I envisage Adam and Eve as being adult. But in some ways, they are children. They're still, if you like, in a state of naivete. They've never encountered anything that was evil. So if you're, th if you're threatened by good and evil, and you have no idea what evil is, you, you don't understand what's going on. That's, that's what's nice. It's when our grandchildren, for example, don't know what evil is. And you just pray because you know very soon they will start to learn. And that's, we wish we could keep everybody in the garden. And in this stage, uh, there was this naivete that's there. God is able to put this restriction on human beings because of that vertical relationship that we saw up here earlier. We had God, the higher point on the hierarchical authority structure, and then we have human beings. God has control. He has authority. So he is able to establish moral boundaries. And from a theological perspective, we, coming from our particular view, would see God as being benevolent. God is good. God looking after our interests. God of grace and love and hope. We would say God would put these restrictions for our own good. We might not know why they're there. And if you like, I would say when we were kids, we still probably do it. If restrictions are placed on it, we still ask why, and then we're also asking how can I push against these envelopes. We don't seem to like constraints. Uh, but from the biblical perspective, if God is good, God has authority, uh, even though we might not understand them, they, we would still live in faith that they're for our own protection, for our own good. And one reason why they could be given is we could say God is not always apparent in the garden. God is not always like physically there. We can see this in chapter eight. Or sorry, chapter three, verse eight. This is jumping ahead a little bit. When that fall takes place, <coughs> and human beings eat, and they become self-conscious. It says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of God as he was walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Oh, funny picture, but for myself. There's a little bush with a bear behind sticking out. Adam, where are you? But uh, anyway, uh, it seems as if from the human perspective, God hadn't been there before, but now he's in the garden with them. And what we've got here is a picture of living in God's will, living with faith and integrity, say is living here by God's word when God is absent from the garden. How should I then live in my relationship with creation but to obey in trust? Uh, I don't know why you didn't let me eat this kumquat or rutabaga or what oh, those trees are in the rutabaga. But uh, whatever in this tree it is restricted and I have to believe it was for our good. 
Then we come to an interesting section in chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. We didn't read the last verse before the end of chapter 1. But at the end of creation, it said, God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. But now all of a sudden in chapter 2, he says, It's not good for man to be alone. So something is not good. So I would ask, what does being alone mean? God is there. The animals and plants are there. What does this mean? Another big word that you don't have to remember after you leave here. But the whole philosophical area of study is called ontology. <coughs> the study of the nature of being, of essence. Who are we? Is what am I? something that you ask when you're young and you keep asking. That's an ontological question. Do you care what the name of it is? No. Um, but you're asking being in essence. What God is saying, there's no one like you in essence. The animals are there, the plants are there. There's, remember we talked about the levels. We have God and we have human beings plants and animals, nobody is there at the same level as you. It's in this picture that we see in Genesis 2. We just have the man, the Adam. No one on the same level. He needs a helper suitable for him, equivalent to him somehow. We'll look at this verse a little bit later in detail. I need somebody at my level, not above me, not below me. I need somebody to have fellowship with, somebody to stand beside me, not to be my boss, not for me to boss, uh, but somebody who's like me. And that's where fellowship comes in. Because to be human is to be in relationship. That's one thing I think that was a disadvantage that came in when we came to the Enlightenment, the period when people started to question the rise of individualism, I did it my way. Sorry to jump on Frank Sinatra fans. It's an interesting <laughs> song, but philosophically it's problematic. And it was interesting, we found this in when we lived in South Africa. And I know it's this way in other societies too, where in South Africa, the tribal cultures, if you like, they couldn't see how you could be an individual living by yourself. For example, when there was a baptism, somebody would become a Christian, and the pastor, whoever led them to the Lord, would say, would you like to be baptized? And they said, yes, and they said, come next Sunday. And he would come, or she would come with a spouse, or in some societies with the three or four spouses, uh, with their 27 kids, with the parents, with the aunts and uncles, everybody, because this is who I am. This is who I am, not just this. And I think we have lost a lot of this, the whole importance of fellowship and community. But that's part of creation. And really what we've got in our life, contemporary life, as well as the biblical life, is a search for fellowship. A search to not be alone. Because God recognized that this isn't good, it's not who we are as human beings. And so notice the approach that God makes here. I would say God is all-knowing. He knew the ultimate answer. But first it says he brought the animals to, to Adam. Not that he had this chart in front of him and said, animals, I'm here, animals, the next one down. No, they're not like me. I like animals. So he names them. But as we said, naming shows authority. It also shows part of God's creative ability. We saw that part of creation in Genesis 1, a number of places, was separation, categorization, putting things into their own cubbyhole, if you like. So the human being was able to do this, but the fact that he could show authority over something says it's not somebody at my level. But in naming them, he's exercising uh, the sovereignty given to him by God as God's co-creator. The animals are good. The dog might be man's best friend, but it is not 
like him in the same way. They're not a suitable helper. So what happens? We introduce a new character, Isha, in the Hebrew translated transliteration from the Hebrew. It's something that's made from Ish. And then you can see here Ish, the same letters. This is the feminine form. There's a word play going on here. Uh, it's kind of a chauvinistic thing from our perspective, but uh, we've got man and we've got a female man, but they're of the same category. There's this word play that's going on here. There's now a more intimate relationship available there. As I said, the garden is all about relationships, and here the relationship is between the sexes, the male and the female. And he recognizes this. We have a different response than when the animals come. When the animals come, frog, giraffe, he names them all. But this time, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. He's making Remember that philosophical word before? He's making an ontological statement. He's making an essence statement. This is me. This is what I made up. Uh, this is the relationship that I need. This is somebody on my level that I can relate to at a different level. Saying, at last, if you like, Eureka! Combining, not that I have anything against animals, but. Uh, you're right, but I need somebody that I can relate to on a completely different level. It seems a little bit inconsistent to me that this verse 19 and, and 20a is inserted in here between I will make a helper suitable for him and I'm making one for you. It seems almost as though that he's allowing an opportunity to find out if there is a suitable helper in the animals before he creates a suitable helper of Eve. Or he could be led, saying, do you as a human male have enough discernment to recognize where a suitable helper is? He knows what his ultimate goal is, but he's saying, are you smart enough to recognize this? And that could be what's happening. So you're right, there is a process here. A good story is such that you have a status quo that you start with, and then attention comes in. So you're saying, how is this going to be resolved? So this is a good narrative technique as well to say, look, here is a distraction. Is the human male going to be uh, diverted from God's ultimate purpose? Uh, but then, no, he says, again, there wasn't anything wrong with the animals, but uh, he, he's joining in the process, if you like, if you could read it here. So he's saying, now, now there's somebody like me. These and that existed before, but now there's something like me. So this brings us to the whole topic of human sexuality, where he says, God says, aloneness is not good. And one way to achieve relationship is through marriage. But marriage is not the only way to do so. Because if you think about it, Jesus, unless you're a popular filmmaker, uh, some of them have portrayed it differently, but the portrait we have of Jesus, he was not married. Uh, but he lived in relationship. So there are other ways besides marriage uh, that this can be done. But human sexuality is important. And I think the church often fails to recognize and nurture this. Uh, we have, and I don't know this church well enough to do it, but we, all, we often have uh, children's church, and then we have uh, young marriage class. But then what do we do with the people who are not children and who are not married? We've got you that we kind of, um, where to stick you? Um, I think we need positive examples of friendships between the genders and within the same gender. Things that are not, if you like, physically sexual, even though they're lived by incarnate sexual beings. What we have 
here that's being developed is a relationship that's involved with commitment. Uh, and that's what we've got. I'm looking here at verse 24 in particular. That's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Marriage, this relationship, is covenantal. It's the making and receiving of promises between two beings. And the actual marriage is the public display of that. In our society, the relationship would have developed uh, before marriage, but then we make a public declaration. And marriage does need both aspects, the internal relationship that we have with each other, uh, the emotional ties, if you like, and also the outward uh, legal part of it, too. And in verse 24, we have several legs of that relationship. One is leave your father and mother. So a new unit is created. There's a shift of focus. Up until this time, our authority was our parents, like theoretically. Um, they start pressing the boundaries, the older they get. But now there's a shift of orientation. And a new unit is being created. And this is where some of the problems that come in. Uh, my wife is a counselor. And she did, one time, uh, couples counseling, marriage counseling. And some of the problems would be is that you have a couple, husband and wife, but mom is kind of there, mm -hmm. or dad is there. Still, there's too much unbroken ties that goes on there. You have to have a leaving. Now, this doesn't have to be a physical leaving. We come from Amish country up in Ohio. And there, quite often what happens, you have the family home, and then the oldest son gets married, and they'll build a house that and sometimes is physically connected to the original house. And the son and his wife would move in there. But they are a separate physical unit. Soon after we were married, uh, through different circumstances, we came back and lived in my in-law's basement, which is a great blessing to us. But we were separate family units. We were not physically separated, but orientationally we had separated. Then it also says, be united to his wife, cleave to his wife is a King James term. This is a relational or covenant word. This is the idea of faithfulness, permanence. Uh, the Hebrew word is the word for glue. It's not a one night stand. This is a permanent commitment. And then also it says, the two shall become one flesh. <coughs> so here we have the sexual element of it. So these are guidelines from creation, as I say. This is how we were made. And we ignore them at our own risk. We already mentioned the risk. If we don't leave enough, we have problems. If we don't cleave enough, if we don't keep the faithful relationship that we've got there, we can have problems. Yes, question? From a textual standpoint, verse 24 seems a little out of sync to me because the, the mere reference to a father and a mother mm -hmm. when they are God-created single things. Yeah, this is, that's a good point here. What we've got is a narrator's description of events that happened at a time in the past. So you've got to see when are we in the story and when are we in the narrator, if you like. And so that's where the narrator's coming in. He's observing this and saying, we now have marriage. Uh, at this time, when this happens, there is no father and mother, if you like God. So, uh, I, I wonder, is this... Is this, with this kind of passage in this verse, in this break in the narrative, the evidence of the oral tradition of how this was passed? Because it sounds like this is that break in the story where you've gone far enough to say, and that's why these things are how they are. And, that, you know, and the moral of the story is... Yeah, it could be oral or it could be written. It doesn't matter how it's done. But there is, there is a disjunction between story and teller of the story. <clears throat> See that that's a good point to note there. Some comments here on biblical personhood. 
The sexes are equal, but they're different. Uh, there's no indication here of male domination. The hierarchical chart that we had there had man and woman on the same level. And also, you're, as a person, you're involved. You've got a physical being, you've got an emotional being, you've got an intellectual being, relational, spiritual, and Sexuality, if you like, relates to all of these areas. We're not just male or female physically, but we are emotionally. Uh, Marva Dawn, who's an author who's written on this particular area, talks, differentiates between social sexuality and genital sexuality. And what it's talking about here, genital sexuality, is reserved for a committed relationship like this. But even without this, genital relationship, we're still sexual beings. That's where social, social sexuality comes in. And that's where I was saying that sometimes we as a church fall down. We don't provide good examples, if you like, good teaching on how do we live as Christians, even though we're sexual beings, in a non-sexual way. How do we relate to each other? But sex is important in scripture. His whole idea, Eureka at last, you did notice this is somebody like me, but probably a bit different. Sexuality is important in Scripture. The Song of Solomon, we'll talk about that next semester. It looks on the surface reading as if it's about sex. Some people don't like that. You can't have sex in the Bible, so it must be something else. Uh, Proverbs 5, sexuality is important. Uh, but as I say here, the meaning of a genital sexual relationship arises from a loving commitment. Also, this eureka moment, the flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. So say, a woman is valued for herself. There's no mention of ch children or anything. It's not good that man should be alone. And the way it is addressed by God is bring another human being into his life. And she is important to the man. Ch children follow, but that's not why she's valued here. And this is a creation account to say the world as it now exists. Relationship and community are part of that creation, and we're not created to be alone. Kind of summarizing this. I've gone beyond my 30 minutes, but I just want to bring out one other aspect in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. We talked about a helper suitable for him. The Hebrew word for helper is azer. Too many times this description of the woman is downplaying the importance of the woman. For example, my brother-in-law is a linesman for Seattle Power and Light. So he had a lot of training. Uh, he also would have a helper who would be the one that goes, gets the stuff out of the truck, does the scut work, the grunt work, your slave, your servant, if you like, a second-rate citizen. That's not what's going on here with this word. We won't take time to read yet Exodus 18, but it's talking about God is our helper. It's not God being now less than we are. Uh, it's not a negative connotation. God is standing beside human beings in certain endeavors. And that's the same with the woman. There's similarity and supplementarity between the male and the female. It's not a domination, uh, not a subservience role. And it's the idea of standing beside the human being, the man that was there, not behind him. 